Several years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to spend about a week floating down the Rhine River on a river cruise. During the cruise, one of the tours took us to a region where you could see the river basin lying below. Knowing the history of the region and the millennia of conflict that had taken so many lives, this was the first time I really understood the why. The farmland laying before us with the river meandering through the valley floor crystallized why this region was so valuable. With its role in shaping the history of Western Europe, the Rhine is truly one of the world's great rivers. We'll begin by locating the Rhine in Western Europe. The river starts in the Alps near Basel, Switzerland. The river then flows north along France and through Germany before turning west and ending in the Netherlands, where it drains into the North Sea near Rotterdam. As the river has been a part of European history for such a long time, the people within the basin have given it many names. Currently, Germany, France, and the Netherlands each have the river named in their own languages. Historical names from the original Celts and the invading Romans show how deeply the river's influence goes into history. As with many of the world's great rivers, the Rhine has humble origins. It doesn't even start as the Rhine. Rather, the Rhine starts where two other rivers come together. One of the starting points of the river is Lake Toma, which drains into the Vanderhein River. The second starting tributary of the Rhine is the Hinterhein River. These rivers start in the Alps at 7,690 feet, or 2,344 meters. The Rhine begins at the junction of the two rivers near Chur, continuing to flow through the Alps until it comes to Lake Constance, at which point the river is channelized into the lake and slows down due to the decrease in the slope of the land. The Rhine leaves Lake Constance and enters more steep country where it gains velocity, entering Switzerland where one can find the Rhine Falls. This region has many tributaries entering the main stem of the river and is defined by rapids. The area transitions into a flat river valley near Basel. This region of the Rhine is a relatively narrow valley, approximately 20 miles wide, that flows through a well-defined floodplain. This is the region where the Main River joins the Rhine, continuing their journey onto the North Sea. The river returns into a narrow gorge that winds through the Hunsruck and Tanus Mountains. The landscape of the region is rich in vineyards and overlooked by castles. This is a beautiful section of the river, and one that is prized by river cruisers for the sheer beauty of the landscape and the many castles overlooking the gorge, where they keep an eye on those who motor up and down the river. Finally, the river enters the lower floodplain, beginning its journey to the west, through the Netherlands. And then we arrive at the Black Sea, which is the endpoint of the Rhine. The Rhine River Basin drains a significant portion of Western Europe and contains some larger rivers within the overall watershed. In addition to the main channel of the Rhine River, there is also the Main River that joins the main stem of the river at the junction of the Upper and Middle River. Another large river, the Moselle, comes and joins the main stem from the south. Having described where the Rhine River flows and the overall watershed basin, here are some general facts. The Rhine is the 11th longest river in Europe. It is 1,230 kilometers, or 764 miles, from the source to the North Sea. There are six major sub-basins or drainages within the larger watershed. The overall size of the entire watershed is 185,000 kilometers square, or 760 miles square. So while not the biggest river, it more than makes up for its size in relation to the historic importance of the river. As a piece of that history, the Rhine served as one of the borders of the Roman Empire, beyond which barbarians ruled. The Rhine watershed was formed by two ancient processes, plate tectonics and ocean sedimentation. These processes formed very different physical geographies that make the Rhine such an interesting river to explore. The headwaters of the Rhine River, lying in the Alps, is defined by the banging together of the Eurasian Plate and the African Plate several million years ago. As these plates met, the African Plate rolled on top of the European Plate, with the land on the African Plate being forced upwards. As these two plates continued to push against each other, the Alps rose about a thousand meters per million years.
So not a terribly fast rate, but long enough to create the mountain range we know and love today. This geological activity creates a really interesting landscape in the heart of Europe. One of the classic geologic features of the Alps is the Matterhorn Mountain. Now the material in the middle of the Matterhorn is from the European plate. However, the surface material of the Matterhorn is from the African plate. So is the iconic Matterhorn a European mountain or an African mountain? I'll let you decide. Of course, plate tectonics varies over time as the plates move and shuffle against each other. Within the Alps, the two plates started to pull away from each other, creating the Rhine Rift Valley, with the Black Forest on the German side and the Vosges Forest on the French side. Over time, and many different drainage patterns, the ancient Rhine formed in this valley, which eventually became the Rhine we know today that drains to the North Sea. The history of the ancient Rhine is for another video. As the Rhine leaves the Alps and enters the lower and flatter portion of the basin, it enters the historic North Sea area. In this region, the land is defined by sediment deposition in which soil was collected from erosional areas. This soil deposition is one of the reasons the area is so productive in terms of agricultural production. The Ice Ages and the advancing and retreating glaciers did a lot to shape the Rhine River Basin after it was formed by the movement of plates. The ice sheet shaped the mountains and carved readily identified U-shaped valleys, many of which lie within the basin. In addition, with the retreat of the glaciers and the melting water, a lot of the sediment was carried down the river into the region that is now the Netherlands, depositing tons of material in this lowland area. As we are in an interglacial period between ice ages, we no longer have the massive ice sheets we saw 10,000 years ago. That does not mean we have lost all the glaciers. There are still glaciers in the Alps that serve to provide meltwater to the Rhine, providing season-long flow through the summer months. As you can see in this image, these much smaller glaciers are still carving the land. However, with climate change, we are seeing these glaciers retreating, with the real possibility of their disappearing in our lifetime. If you are river cruising the Rhine, and you have a day at port with not much to do, as if that would be a problem. You can ask your captain for a pan and do a little gold prospecting in the river. The Rhine used to have a pretty good gold industry before the turn of the 1900s. Sediment carried from the Alps had flakes of gold intermixed in the silicate deposit. There is enough gold to have a nice little industry along the river. However, the damming of the river and the increase in sediment has resulted in the gravelly areas in which these deposits would be laid down are now covered by sediment. But who knows? You may be lucky and find the nugget that pays for your cruise. The geology of the region serves as the foundation upon which the Rhine River Basin was created and defines the land through which it flows. But once the geology laid down the land, it was the plants and animals that further shaped the area. So let's move from our discussion of geology to looking at ecology, with a particular focus on the plant communities through which the river flows. The Rhine River Basin occurs in four different ecoregions, including the Alps, the Alps conifer and mixed forest, the Western European broadleaf forest, and the Northern and Southern temperate Atlantic regions. I imagine you're asking, what is an ecoregion? I'm glad that you asked. In ecological terms, an ecoregion is that area of water or land that has a set of natural communities that share common characteristics, such as environmental conditions, species, and certain ecological dynamics. With the river basin as large as the Rhine and spanning high, al high alpine regions to the ocean interface, we would expect to see different ecoregions. The conifer and mixed forest ecoregion starting at the highest elevation consists of the alpine tundra zone that is dominated by low shrubs, grasses, and very hardy forbs. These windstep regions are harsh climates in which only the toughest plants can survive. Moving down, we come to a conifer zone dominated by needle-bearing trees such as the silver fir pictured in the middle. Further on down the mountain, at the bottom of this ecoregion, we find more deciduous trees such as the silver birch pictured on the right aspen, and some pine trees. In order to explore these regions on your own, you will need to do a little work to get to the higher reaches of the basin. The river tributaries in this zone are 
in this zone are too small to allow boats of any size to navigate up the rivers and tributaries. However, it is really pretty. Moving lower in the Rhine River Basin, we enter the Western European broadleafed forest region, which is dominated by mixed deciduous forests, which is a term for trees that lose their leaves. One of the more common species that you will find in this region is the beech tree seen here. This seeker region is characterized by the rolling hills that are in the upper regions of the navigable portion of the Rhine, and is the environment people think of in relation to traveling through this part of the basin. With the more favorable climate and topography, much of this region has been converted to agriculture and wine production. Continuing our journey down the elevation of the Rhine River, we enter the northern and southern temperate Atlantic region. In lesser disturbed areas within this ecoregion, we will find deciduous forests that are dominated by oaks. As we get closer to the ocean, in areas of lesser disturbance, we may find bogs in low-lying areas. However, the natural community in this ecoregion has been significantly changed by humans and converted to agricultural and other uses. While these ecoregions highlight the kind of vegetation that would appear on the site without human disturbance, much of the Rhine River Basin has been changed by human interventions. These interventions have changed the landscapes in ways that have changed how the river operates. Our pre-human ancestors have a long history within the Rhine region. The earliest known human ancestor was Homo heidelbergensis, who arrived in the area between 400 and 700,000 years ago. While there have been some bone remnants found of these earliest ancestors, they managed to come into the region through a place that had no border checkpoints, so we don't know the exact date of their arrival. They were followed by Homo neanderthalensis, who arrived around 45,000 years ago. And modern humans arrived in the region around 35,000 years ago. These earliest humans hunted in the region because we found their hunting equipment within the basin. I bet someone got into a lot of trouble for leaving that behind. Following the retreat of Ice Age glaciers, humans again moved into the region. They were able to make very productive use of the grasslands that dominated the landscape following the glacial retreat. However, as forests began to encroach in these areas, these communities became smaller. There is some evidence that there is the beginnings of agriculture in the region around 6,000 to 7,000 years ago but nothing of the scale to result in significant changes to the environment. In the pre-modern period, the first settlers in the Rhine River Valley were the Celts. The Celts began intensive agriculture that saw the first significant changes to the ecosystem through which the river flowed. Flat areas in the lower parts of the basin were drained and converted to annual crops, while forests were cleared for grazing and crop production. In addition, forts and armed farms were constructed that required material and manpower, which meant even more intensive conversion of the land. While those living within the lower portions of the Rhine River were learning to farm the land, it was not an easy life. As the Roman Plinius described their condition, they built their houses on high points that were frequently inundated by tidal shifts. So for these early people in the area, flooding in high water was a major concern one that persists to this day. In addition to critiquing the original inhabitants of the area, the Romans built many cities in the basin, such as Basel and Cologne. One can still find the remnants of these cities within these modern areas. These ancient sites highlight one of the major challenges of urban development, even if it was ancient urban development. The Romans were fairly advanced engineers when it came to moving water. Their communal toilets were hooked into buried sewer systems that carried the waste away. However, unlike modern sewage systems, and I mean very modern sewage treatment systems, their system for treating waste was a bit primitive. Once the sewage entered the sewer pipes, it was directed down slope where gravity carried it to the river. Once it came to the river, the sewer pipes dumped the sewage into the river where it flowed downstream. And once it flows downstream, it flows out of mind. The sewage is out of mind unless someone is doing the same thing in a city that lies upstream of where you live, especially if you are getting your water from that river, which they did. Ew. While there has always been coal and iron in the Rhine River Basin, before the 1800s, these industries were largely small and local. Much of the ironwork was done with charcoal, which resulted in much deforestation. 
As with the small and localized scope of charcoal production, iron and other metalworks remain contained to these small regions in the mountains. Technological developments in these industries would take time to increase the value of these resources and change the significance of their influences in the watershed. As with most river systems, water levels fluctuate on the Rhine with periods of low flow and periods of high flow known as floods. Before modern times, those who lived along the river just suffered through these floods. There was seldom enough knowledge or funds to allow for an effective control of flooding on a large scale. High value areas such as urban regions did have some basic flood protection such as dikes and levees, but these were constrained to these regions. If you lived outside of these regions, you dealt with flooded land and damaged crops on your own. Another problem that many people in the Rhine faced was the loss of forests adjacent to the rivers. As these forests were removed and converted to rich agricultural land, flooding increased as the water could move through the lands faster because of slower infiltration and, left, and less roughness to the landscape. The Rhine has always been an important river for navigation. However, it has been resistant to efforts to tame it. Before modern times, the Romans were the first people to attempt to train the river, allowing for greater transport. Efforts to stabilize the channel and reduce sandbars and other in-channel obstacles were attempted to make fighting Germanic tribes easier. In addition, these efforts were used to enhance navigation for commercial regions, trying to ensure that ports were open and goods could move up and down the river. While pre-modern farmers, manufacturers, and commercial interests may have wanted to have more influence on the Rhine River to enhance their own interests, their interests remained largely localized to confined areas, and the extent of the modification was generally pretty minimal. While the Romans did have a significant influence, much of their influence ebbed following their abandonment of the region, with the system reverting to a more naturalized condition. The principal barriers to the significant development of the river, and the reason the river remained fairly wild, was a general lack of coordination. There was not the regional or basin-wide systems that would allow for the large-scale effort needed for a substantial river modification. In addition, channel modification and flood control are expensive. Money was a significant hindrance to taming the river. Finally, there is a lack of technological information for the best way to do a major taming of the river. However, these obstacles would soon fall. It was in the 1800s when things in the Rhine River changed dramatically. The region, once dominated by agriculture with dispersed manufacturing, became an economic juggernaut with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution. With technical developments in iron manufacturing, the region moved from the traditional use of charcoal to coal and began the serious business of producing iron and steel. The largest impact of these activities was centered around the Rhineland-Westphalia region. The earliest of these factories were less than environmentally sensitive, with mines dumping waste material into the river, contributing heavy metals and other pollutants in sufficient quantities to impact the river for much of the downstream length. In addition to the development of the iron and steel industry, chemical production also grew. As with the metal industry, waste from these factories and plants was originally dumped into the river. Out of sight, out of mind, was a standard for these early industries. Of course, out of sight was contained to the dumping spot. It quickly returned to site to the downstream communities who could no longer draw water directly from the river. With the growth of the chemical and steel industries, these factories needed people. And the people came. In 1819, the German part of the Rhine River Basin had 5.4 million people. In 1970, there was a population of 32 million people. As we discussed during the Worm and Town slide, having more people means that you have more waste. With more people, we had more pool, well, you know what I mean, entering the system. In order to treat this sewage, Frankfurt was the first city to install a treatment plant in 1887. Many other cities quickly followed suit. However, even with the fast development and installation of these treatment facilities, they were not able to keep up with the seemingly endless population growth. Based on the changing needs within the basin, there was a desire to better manage the river. There were three features that came together to shift from humans training the river to humans taming the river. These included better flood control, 
more effective river management for transportation, and industrialization. Before technological transformation and the development of motorized commercial river transport, most of the traffic on the river went downriver via rafts or sailing ships. The current made for an easy method of propulsion. However, moving goods and people upstream required horses, following well-worn paths along the river to pull barges and other transports up the river. With coal and then gas-powered combustion engines, transport up and down the river became easier. However, this increase in river transportation required significant changes to the channel itself. Now, goods moved into the river from the ocean and moved down the river to the world market. While the Rhine River Channel historically migrated across the floodplain, often cutting new channels following major floods, this was a major problem for the new river navigation needs. In addition, with the river that occupies a larger floodplain, the ships often had trouble finding a channel deep enough to allow them to get larger ships up and down the river. Finally, efforts had to be made to reduce sandbars and other obstructions that influenced the ability of ships to move through the river channel. This is an image of the changing nature of a small section of the Rhine River Channel. As you can see, in the 1778 map, we have a river with multiple channels taking up the majority of its floodplain. There were sandbars scattered throughout the channel that could be disastrous for shippers. In the 1926 map, we can see they have concentrated much of this area into a single channel. However, there is still a significant floodplain and some smaller meandering channels in the floodplain. There is also a big bend in the river that ships would have to navigate around. And then the 2010 image shows how the river channel has been significantly straightened and much of the river floodplain has been eliminated. So through massive handworks and then machine works, the river was moved and chained into a confined channel. One of the problems with channelizing the river was that it made the current much faster. In addition, the Rhine had small areas of waterfalls and rapids. These areas had to be managed to provide for a safe passage within the channelized channel. In order to create a more level environment and regulate the speed of water, the lock and dam system was installed throughout the river. This allowed for slowing the water to be more navigable and to reduce the slope of the river. Over time, a series of 10 lock and dam structures were installed. Earlier, we talked about the gold industry in the Rhine River Basin. However, the channeling of the river and the building of a lock and dam system has disrupted the normal flow of the river and changed sediment patterns. Now sediment is clogging portions of the river while being blown out in other areas. With climate change and an alteration of water levels, these sediment loads are leading to navigation challenges with calls to address the sedimentation. However, as we are learning, when we correct mistakes of the past, we often just make new mistakes for the future. While the need for better navigation on the river has resulted in significant changes to the natural course of the river, another significant change to the river was the need for flood protection. As cities became denser and larger, losses from flooding became a major economic concern. Outside of the direct channel, there are significant efforts in building upland drainage to put more area into a productive use, while also serving as floodplain or upland water storage areas. However, as you can imagine, Draining these areas meant that you were moving this water downstream, where it entered the main channel faster, which means that downstream areas had to manage more river flooding and additional flooding from surface land drainage. In addition to draining the land to protect and extend the riverbank area, dams were installed in several places within the Rhine River Basin. These dams had multiple purposes, such as improving navigation, creating hydropower, and enhancing flood protection. After all, if one could slow the water upstream behind a dam, then that would certainly protect downstream communities and land, right? Well, sort of. While dams can provide hydropower and reduce downstream flooding, they are not without significant environmental impacts, which occur both above the dam in the reservoir pool and below the dam in the outlet. These changes to the ecological condition of the dam can persist for miles downstream. During much of the human history with the river, it was an easy place to get rid of human waste. Before the middle of the 18th century, these discharges only affected the local communities and were often diluted as they flowed downstream. 
However, with the rise of industrialization, the growth of cities and the discharge of human waste, the intensification of agriculture, and the human design changes to the river, the Rhine was treated as a sewer. Waste could be diverted to the river and then flow downstream. Again, out of sight, out of mind. While the water quality conditions in the Rhine River Basin generally got worse through the early part of the 20th century, the bombing of industrial and urban areas during World War II saw a temporary pause in water quality degradation. The destruction of these areas resulted in a short-term improvement to the general water quality of the river. One of the challenges that cities along the Rhine were realizing in the middle of the 20th century was that the water drawn from the river was becoming increasingly expensive to treat and use as drinking water. One of the first regions to recognize this was the Alsace region in France, where the pollution discharged from potash mining was increasing salinity in the river, which had to be reduced before it could be used as drinking water. The increasing recognition that water pollution in the Rhine was causing significant regional water quality issues led to the establishment of the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine in the 1950s. This commission consists of five member nations, including Germany, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. The hydrology and quantity of water in the Rhine was also an issue, particularly for navigation. In order to respond to and manage the river for water quantity, the International Commission for the Hydrology of the Rhine Basin was established in the 1970s. While these new governing structures work hard to improve the water quality and quantity challenges faced by those who are living and working in the Rhine Basin, there are still periodic challenges such as the Sandoz plant fire that led to the discharge of agricultural pesticides, which harmed 400 kilometers of river, resulting in significant damage to the fishery and many other aspects of the river. With the changes to the governing structure and increasing concern around the river, where does it stand today? Well, let's look at the river through three different lenses. In the next few slides, we will explore what has changed in the river through the perspectives of water chemistry, physics, and biology. Within the Rhine Basin, there is good news regarding some of the more common pollutants found in aquatic systems. The amount of phosphorus and nitrogen has been reduced significantly. In addition, heavy metals concentrations are coming down. These are the result of improvements in urban sewage treatment and reductions in industrial pollutant discharges. While much of the chemistry within the Rhine River system has shown improvements, there are still some areas for improvement, such as the use and discharge of pesticides to the river. While water chemistry can be hard to see within any particular section of the river, improvements in water chemistry have real outcomes, such as the case of Rotterdam having to remove 50% less sludge from the harbor due to upstream improvements. Sludge, such an appropriate word for a pretty nasty substance. When we look at the physics of the river, we will focus on flooding, drought, and the changes in the sediment loads. Human cost changes to the Rhine River Basin will be around for many years. It is unlikely that there will be any large scale restoration of the main channel to a more natural course or that the floodplain will be substantially increased. There is just too much commercial traffic and economic activity within the basin. However, there are efforts to do things like restore wetlands and mitigate some of the drainage to store a bit more water on the land. These actions are proceeding apace and can serve to mitigate the high water in the tributaries in the channel. On the opposite end of the water quantity spectrum, we have drought and low water conditions. In recent years, these low water conditions have made navigation of the main stem river difficult, with much of the larger shipping traffic being suspended. There are efforts to deepen the channel through dredging and to improve flow from the uplands during dry periods. However, when there's no water, there's not much anyone can do. The changing climate is resulting in large swings in the quantity of water within the basin. One year, there may be floods that overwhelm the defenses of small and large cities. The next year, there may be a drought that prevents the usage of a port. In addition to the swings in the return period of floods and droughts, the changing climate appears to be making these conditions worse. The future is uncertain, but will undoubtedly pose challenges for the effective management of the river. Sediment within the river continues to be a problem. As this picture shows, sediment contributions can vary widely by river basin, and some basins can have much higher sediment loads than others, which creates a remarkable visual when the two rivers come together.
Sediment also carries with it many heavy metals, which are a further cause for concern. In order to address the sediment concerns within the basin, there are efforts to reduce sediment transfer that, occur that occurs with flooding, shipping passage, and dredging. Again, due to flooding, climate change, and river channelization, sediment transport is going to be an ongoing concern. Moving on from the physics within the watershed, let's look at the biology, which consists of the habitat, plants, and animals living within the larger watershed. The human changes to the Rhine River system have caused real and lasting harm to the habitat for many of the plants and animals that live within the watershed. However, there are efforts underway to restore many of these habitat components to provide the ability for plants and animals to move up and down the river. Some of these efforts focus on reconnecting oxbow lakes to the river during flooding events. While the picture on the left is not from the Rhine, it does show a great oxbow lake. The river channel has migrated and cut off this old section of the channel. It only gets reconnected to the river during floods. These are important refuges for many fish and animals. In addition, there are efforts to ensure fish and other animals can get around dams such as this fish ladder near Koblenz. While it is a large effort, there is the intention to reconnect the river system from the North Sea to Lake Constance. This is truly a massive endeavor and one that will take years, but it is a commendable commitment made by the countries along the main stem of the Rhine. As we think about the plants within the Rhine River system, we have the phytoplankton that are the microscopic organisms within the river. Adjacent to the river, we have the riparian plant communities that can provide habitat and reduce erosion from the shore. Finally, we move into the upland areas of the forests, which can hold snow and water and contribute to soil stability and water quantity throughout the year. Phytoplankton are the microscopic plants that make up the foundation of the ecological community within most water bodies. These plants are strongly influenced by the nutrients within the water. When there is excess phosphorus and nitrogen, certain species of phytoplankton come to dominate and can cause algae blooms, which can quickly consume the oxygen in the water, reducing the amount available for higher forms of life. The reductions of phosphorus within the river has greatly reduced these kinds of algae, and the river is turning to a healthier assemblage of phytoplankton. The riparian area is the environment that exists directly next to the river and is directly influenced by flooding and other river associated conditions. Most of the riparian areas within the Rhine River system are developed and fail to function effectively. However, the countries within the basin are making concerted efforts to restore the natural condition to these areas with some allowance for flooding and a restoration of vegetation. These efforts have seen a doubling of the naturalized riparian areas between 2005 and 2020. The upland forests of the Rhine River Basin have seen substantial changes since humans arrived within the area. With the realization of the cultural and resource values of this resource, there is increasing interest in protecting and restoring these areas for the many benefits they provide. However, climate change is stressing these ecosystems, and there is concern of substantial changes happening in the future. While these regions continue to be under threat, there are efforts to find ways to protect them or to adapt the forest to the potential future climatic conditions. If you do get a chance to take a tour through the Black Forest region, look out the window as you motor through the area to see some of the efforts at managing these changes. Moving up the biological chain, we come to animals, which include the invertebrates, fish, and wildlife. I'm going to focus on those closely associated with the river and leave those species that are found within the larger watershed to someone else to cover. Invertebrates, like plankton, serve to make up the foundation of the aquatic ecosystem. Within the Rhine River, there is a substantial improvement of the assemblage of invertebrate species following the effort to improve water quality in the 1970s. This increase in invertebrate diversity gives a picture of improving water quality. However, things began to change a bit in the 1980s. At that time, many invasive species began to increase their numbers and are starting to cause changes to the ecosystem. With the growing international trade and transport within the river, species from North America and Asia are now being added to the ecosystem, displacing those native species that were making a recovery. With the improving water quality, almost all the fish that we would expect to see in the river are back. Species such as the river lamprey and the Atlantic salmon have returned and are breeding. This is undoubtedly a good news story. 
The European sturgeon has not yet made an official visit, but hopefully soon we can see it back where it belongs. However, it is not all a good news story. As with invertebrates, there are some invasive species, invasive species that are now found within the river. These are being monitored to document their introduction and spread as a way to assess their impact on the overall river ecological quality. The Rhine River and its lakes serve as critical nesting and resting habitat for many species of waterfowl. Between 2015 and 2018, there were over 1 million birds that came through the area, representing more than 70 species. If you are river cruising on the Rhine and have a water level cabin, it will not be unusual to have a duck or goose peeking in at you as you are docked in a port. So make sure to keep your blinds open to see the birds, or maybe keep them closed for privacy from those birds. While we started this presentation with a lot of the changes that humans have made to the Rhine River and how those changes have neg negatively impacted the water quality, quantity, and ecological functioning of the river, we need to end on a high note regarding the current management of the river. The International River Foundation is a group that recognizes the outstanding efforts made by people to protect, conserve, and restore the world's river. The foundation began issuing a River of the Year award in 2013. That year's award winner was the Rhine River. Being selected as the inaugural winner of the award means that the Rhine set the bar for future award winners. This is a true testament to the care and concern of all those involved with managing the river. While there have been some struggles since 2013, those living and working within the basin are still working on improving the river. There is no resting on their laurels in this region.